Right, let's move on. John Bruin is on the line to talk to us about tonight's Champions League game, but also, um, given some of the great stuff that he's been writing recently, we wanted to ask him about West Ham first. Um, John, the, the trouble at the weekend that we saw at the Olympic Stadium, um, it's your contention in a very well-argued piece that actually the ultimate responsibility for this, apart from the personal responsibility for the people involved, lies with the owners at West Ham. You might maybe just explain that a bit for our audience this morning, would you? Yeah, for, um, OK. Uh, I mean... This is a story I've followed for quite a long time. I don't live too far, actually, from, uh, well, uh, the London Stadium, if not Upton Park. And actually, uh, think about it, they're four miles apart. Now, it, it, it goes back to the uh, the grand promises made um, by the owners uh, about what would happen when that club left Upton Park to move to the London Stadium. Now, having said that, the, the club would argue that Talk of Champions League and big budgets and all that were something that might happen rather than something that would happen. But ultimately, what's happened is the club has been locked, been moved lock, stock and barrel to somewhere which does not suit football. Um, I think I think one of the problems is, uh, or the main problem uh, for me, is that football clubs move home these days. Uh, I was looking through the Premier League uh, when I was writing that piece, and uh, ten of the clubs in this season's Premier League have moved grounds in the la- you know in the last generation. And the thing is, you don't talk about Huddersfield Town's Leeds Road. You don't talk about the Victoria Ground. Um, you know, moving down, you don't talk about Burnham Park for Bolton or whatever. Um, and that's because they moved into football grounds that, if they didn't possess that. Uh, you know, that, that nostalgic spirit of the old place. They were more comfortable places to watch football. And the biggest problem with the London Stadium is that it is nothing. Uh, it is not suited to football. It's not a comfortable place to watch football. It's not a comfortable place to get to. Uh, and beyond that, uh, in a footballing sense, the football team is worse than it was in that final season at Upton Park. Um Take a flick through the accounts of uh, which West Ham actually released last week. Uh, you will see that they made a profit uh, in the 40, 43 million. Um, the idea of the owners being benevolent uh, towards the club are shown by the fact they're charging an interest rate. I think it's 6% on the loans they've given to the club. The, the transfer and net spend is not particularly high. And also the hiring of managers has been pretty haphazard. It's moved from one way to another. We had Avram Grant, they had Sam Allardyce, a manager who didn't really fit the club's ethos. They had Slavon Bilic, um, as someone who did a good job for a while, but you know, if you flip through his managerial record, you would see that <clears throat> he's not a manager for sustained success. And now David Moyes. Now, David Moyes is at the club, um, I'm led to believe, due to the fact that he had a close relationship with Tony Henry, who was uh, previously one of the uh, directors of football at that club. Um, now, uh, or, or someone who operated as a sort of de facto director of football, actually in, in partnership with David Sullivan, uh, the, uh, one of the co-owners who uh, is involved rather too much with, with those types of matters. Now, Tony Henry, if you might recall, is somebody who was uh, sacked by the club quite recently uh, due to being exposed, possessing rather um, questionable views on African footballers. Now, pick through that and you've got a club which is, uh, I, I, I've seen it quoted as uh, being the worst run in the Premier League. That's, that's, that's some, someone else's opinion, but flick through the other 2019 clubs you will struggle to find such chaos at the club. And uh, what happened on Saturday, I think, is pretty much... Um, it was always likely to happen, uh, this type of thing. And actually, actually cut down to the, the, the bones of people storming on the pitch and uh, invading... The, one of the reasons they could get onto the pitch is that the stewarding uh, at that ground, I've been there many times, uh, is run by a uh, third-party... Quango, uh, that own the stadium, uh, there's people employed on minimum wage, uh, a lot of foreign students, things like that. And, you know, what, confronted with a 40-year-old, uh, you know, 100-kilo um, football hooligan, they're not going to get in the way. And then we've seen these stories just this week, where, just after that, where West Ham have said, oh, OK, maybe we might be prepared to pay for the... Um, for the upkeep of the, of the security, 
and this only seemed to happen once they, the owners, were threatened by this. I think if you speak to a lot of West Ham's, they will tell you that uh, the security problems have been there ever since the stadium has been opened. Uh, but previously, the owners, the cheapskate owners, were prepared to accept uh, the, the low quality of service that the company that um, the London Stadium was providing. Pick through all that, you've got a club in a real mess, and it's no wonder people are getting angry. Yeah, it's, it seems to be a, a real mess within the supporters as well. There's almost a civil war of sorts going on there. And uh, like, I'm fascinated by it because you seem to have on one side the West Ham United Independent Supporters Association and they're going up against what seems to be the real West Ham fans group, which is essentially the same as the intercity firm, which I understand, John, has actually got decent enough links or has previously sat down with the top brass at West Ham. And just looking a little bit deeper into it, you've got guys called Andy Swallow and Mickey Morgan who founded it, who founded the Intercity Firm. And Andy Swallow has links with the Football Lads Alliance. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here, John, but it doesn't seem like a particularly smart move for uh, the West Ham hierarchy to be aligning with a group like the Football Lads Alliance. Well, absolutely. And... Uh it's, it, but the story was broken last week by uh, like, like our friend Miguel Delaney, um, and um, it's not been denied. Uh, that there is no denial from the, um, the club's owners that such a meeting has taken place. Uh, and I do know that the owners were annoyed that the story got, got out, but they couldn't really um, deny it because it actually happened. There. Um, so what you've got is these factions, and now. Yes, again, we go back to the, to the poor decision making on, on behalf of the um, ownership. Uh, I, I've, I've dealt with the West Ham Independent Sport Association a couple of times. Uh, you know, pretty died in the world fans, want the best for their club, uh, pretty respectable group of people. Um, but what they've done in the past is they've criticised the owners, and uh, the owners have egos. And uh, so they decided to deal with a different fans group uh, and in doing so committed a huge PR own goal and if their aim was to uh, silence the trouble around their club and calm things down it failed utterly because if, if the uh, if the West Ham supporters club slash ICF's uh, diktat was to stop people um, protesting then what we saw on Saturday went completely against that so that's backfired in their place. Another huge mistake made by the owners. Um, and uh, there is a bit of a PR war going on out, out there. Um, but I think it's one that they're struggling to win. I think it, it, it's a crisis point for that ownership now. I really think so. We'll definitely come back to this story and, and see exactly what happens. But we do want to talk a little bit about what hopefully is going to happen on the field tonight. Um, this Manchester United-Sevilla game... It's actually very well set up for somebody like Sevilla to come and poop the Manchester United party. That whole sense of, oh, nil-all draw is not a bad result away from home. It's not a great result away from home because uh, one-all draw tonight and you go out. So, also, I guess most Man United fans are going to be pretty happy with the fact that they won um, the big game against Liverpool. But there's also that continuous sense that, well, they're not always going to score from every chance they generate or from two thirds of the chances that they generate. So one of these nights, somebody like Rashford doesn't have um, one of his best games and all of a sudden they're, um, they're clinging on for dear life and a supposedly an inferior side like Sevilla are going through. Yes, I, I always think that a nil-nil away um, in the Champions League or over two-legged competition uh, it, it is, is problematic. Um, I think United learned their lesson on that you know, back in 2000 when they went away to um, Real Madrid, drew nil-nil. It was a result celebrated back in Manchester. They conceded two early goals, an own goal by Roy Keane, which everyone will remember. And then they're chasing their tails. And um, again, uh, I mean, they held a similar 10 years ago, in fact. They, they, they attempted something similar against Barcelona, got a nil-nil away hung on for a 1-0 win, but I mean, anyone who was at that game, I was, was, you know, hanging on for dear life. Now, Sevilla are not of the grade of the Real Madrid of 2000 or the Barcelona of 2008, but then again, neither are Manchester United as good a team as the vintage of those years. So, you've got a problem. I think I think the point that you're, you're pointing to there, Jet, is that 
the goals that United have scored, say in the games against Chelsea and Liverpool, have come from those moments of individual brilliance, uh, which is pretty much how Jose Mourinho um, wants, his, wants his team to produce. It's almost the old Italian style model where defence is the uh, defence is the key. You lock the back door at all times, and you've got quality forwards who are going to take the chances when they come. And then you sit back and defend, which is pretty much the model we saw against Liverpool at the weekend. Um, I think United fans would like to see, just for once, United breeze into a 2-3-0 lead uh, and then begin the defending. But that really has not been in Mourinho's nature, if at all, certainly since he left Chelsea the first time around. He's, he's a manager who... Uh, as he's got older, as he's got more crotchety, he's become more conservative. Um, you People will continue to say he's a poor fit for Manchester United. The thing is, at the moment, the results have been pretty good. Beating Chelsea, beating Liverpool are changing the results. That um, it's a, it's a, it, That's a big change, really, because a lot of the time Mourinho's been accused of not picking up uh, big results against the, the bigger teams, but those two home wins have certainly turned the tide a little bit amongst United fans, I'd say. Um, but to, to actually think that a team like Sevilla, who themselves are not as good as in previous years, would, should, would be a dangerous uh, opponent, possibly shows that there is a vulnerability about Manchester United that we're still not confident in them under Jose Mourinho. We've talked a lot about Paul Pogba over the last few months, but it seems that this is almost at its most worrying stage because obviously his fitness is up in the air at the moment about whether or not he's going to play tonight. But it seems that that's not dominating the headlines at all. It seems that nobody cares really if Paul Pogba is going to play or not. And ultimately, under Jose Mourinho, it's not going to matter that much. Well, who, who needs Paul Pogba when you've got Scott McTominay? Let's put it that way. Uh, yeah, and the funny thing is that... Um, him not being in the team, uh, in a sense, uh, it, it released Marcus Rashford onto that game at the weekend. Um, with, with McTominay around, um, what it meant was that Jose Mourinho was able to give one of those players who's pushed forward a little more leeway and, and they reap the results of it. Um, I, I've long thought that the, the Pogba thing... Uh, I thought Pogba was overhyped. I mean, you're watching him play, the talent is all there. Uh, there are moments, you know, which will lift fans out of their seats, but the full package is not there in, in the sense that he, the, the, the team needs to be set up around him. Now, that seemed to be easy enough for Juventus back in the days where they were easily the best team and they were winning six titles in succession. Um, but you, you saw that Didier Deschamps have similar problems with their with Pogba back at Euro 2016 and okay uh, United needed a marquee player he was the player that they could get but a, a fit of him and, and Jose Mourinho it always seemed to me that that could be one that could run into trouble and so it's proved um, and one of the things about Mourinho is that you get the impression that he would really enjoy uh, pulling off all these results without Paul Pogba because who would that show as the big man in the club the leading figure rather than the social media star. Well, it's always got to be about Jose Mourinho, hasn't it? So do you, do you sell him in the summer? Do you hope that you can somehow convince PSG to give you your money back and move on? Yeah, um, I, I think, I mean, the, the word is, isn't it, that uh, he, uh, that Real Madrid would be interested. Real Madrid are a team that uh, certainly it seem in need of an overhaul. That seems pushing on in age a little bit. Uh, and of course, PSG always have the money. So United are not without options. Um, and the the other talk is that Mourinho will be given the chance to sign the four players that he wants this summer. So you know, uh, how the hell do you pay for those? Uh, well, you sell a player that you paid eighty nine million for, and you sell him for figures in an inflated market. And if say. Neymar is worth 220 million or whatever. Maybe you can sell Pogba for 150. Then we can start do, do, uh, start buying other players. It's it's a bit of a win-win situation for Mourinho because it, it, it can't be said that he hasn't tried with Pogba. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah I, I think um, you know. I, I think one of the things is that Pogba, when he came back to United, did you really think that he was going to be there for the rest of his career? 
it always seemed like it might not quite work out that way. John, great stuff. Thanks very much for joining us this morning.